afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our University of Illinois Encore series. Uh, the panelists you see in front of you are speaking about um, careers in arts management, and the title is From Music Major to Arts Management. Um, and so uh, we have three panelists who are here, and uh, my colleague Anthony Messina, uh, who will also help um, lead the conversation and discussion. And uh, I'd like to first start with Kelly, and then we'll go with Jeff and then Carlvin, and have each of you introduce yourself, talk about your what you're doing now, um, and maybe how you got to where you are now, um, starting with your um, undergraduate undergraduate career. Um, and um, so, Kelly, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. Um, I am the executive director for the Midwest Band and Orchestra Clinic. Uh, I've been in this position about a year. Um, and I, prior to that, I was the director of educational programs for Con Selmer. Um, so I can talk a little bit about what that was before. But my story started uh, in Northern Indiana. I grew up in a small town in Northern Indiana. Went to Ball State University for my undergrad in instrumental and general music education. And then after that, I um, moved out to Las Vegas, actually. And I got my first teaching gig out there. I lived out there for seven years, loved it. I taught high school orchestra and guitar. Um, and then after uh, seven years out in Las Vegas, uh, I uh, was given the opportunity to come back to the Midwest and work for Con Selmer's Division of Education, which at that time was just starting up. And we did uh, events. Um, primarily, we just did a summer workshop, the Con Selmer Institute, which is for uh, directors specifically um, instrumental music educators. Uh, and then we also did like a few publications and outreaches. Uh, we, we had a really small clinician network that we were just starting up. And I was part of that team for about seven years before I uh, accepted the position as the executive director for Midwest Clinic. So that's, that's kind of my story uh, from music education major to an arts admin position. So. Um, I have a couple follow-ups before we um, hear from Jeff and Carlvin. Um, how, well, first of all, uh, starting a new position right as the pandemic hit, that must have been interesting with the yeah. Midwest. Um, but you know, I think when you when you left um, teaching in Nevada mm -hmm. to go back to the Midwest, was it because of um, the job change? Did you were you seeking that out? And then I think when people hear Con Selmer, you know, they think of an instrument manufacturer. So this education division, do a lot of companies have something like that? And, and how did, you know, how did that get, you know, put together? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I came back to the Midwest for the job. Uh, I actually, while I was teaching at, um, in Las Vegas, I would come back every summer and I actually volunteered for Con Selmer Institute because it existed. It's been around for 25 years or something like that. So it's been around for quite a while. And so I actually came back every summer and volunteered. Um, as uh, just a grunt worker for the conference. And so that's kind of how I, I built a relationship with that organization and um, which led to me eventually being offered that position. Um, but uh, yeah, there actually are a lot of philanthropic arms for uh, for-profit businesses. Um, you know, the, the philosophy behind Con Selmer's Division of Education was that if education is strong, then there's going to be healthy programs uh, that need instruments. So it's basically investing in the future or, you know, your, your future customers. Uh, if you have healthy music education programs, then we're going to have a healthy industry. Um, the idea is not necessarily to take a bigger piece of the pie. You know, we weren't trying to be the cool kids that won. What we wanted more so was to create a bigger pie. You know, we don't want to take a bigger piece of a small pie. Let's just make the bigger, the pie bigger. Because if music education and music is thriving, we're all winning. Um, and a lot of uh, for-profit, especially instrument manufacturing and publication companies, they have arms of their organizations. They're focused on that, um, building and strengthening music education. So, yeah. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, can you tell us about yourself and where you're from and what you've been doing? Sure, yeah. So I'm Jeff, and I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and sort of got into the music the standard way <laughs> that you typically do. Um, and it's, you know, I was a string player, so I started off on violin in fourth grade. I said, here, you're, you take the bus, and you need something you can carry on the bus. And I was like, okay, I like strings. So started off that way, but really took to it. And, um, you know, just had fun. I wasn't one of the top players or anything, but I just had a great time. And uh, my parents are both professors, and so I sort of knew I would go into education somehow, but realized in high school that 
music education was a field that existed. Surprisingly, the people who were teaching me music went to school for it. <laughs> so I had to connect those two together before realizing that that's really what I wanted to pursue in some fashion. So I decided to go to Ithaca College. Uh, I was there from 2014 to 2018, and I did uh, music education in the string track, um, which was fabulous um, because it gave me, you know, I had never really seen music at a high level where I grew up. It was a lot, you know, the fact that it was even offered at my public school was a benefit, but um, to see it and to experience it at a high level was really, was really insightful. And with that came, you know, an infrastructure that exists with lots of live performances, because we had recitals almost every day, we had ensemble concerts once or twice a week. So that at Ithaca, thankfully, um, is a really good outlet for students to find employment. And that was where I sort of found found the other side of the curtain. I, I was stage crew for a couple of years. And my last two years, I was actually a house manager. So I was able to work with the directors sort of day of performance, you know, an hour or so beforehand, you would get a stage plot. And they find, you know, you connect and, and you really feel the engine that is live performance at, you know, especially the day of over and over, which is, I, I really fell in love with and saw that that's kind of the energy that fit most. I really enjoyed classroom teaching, but seeing either people's visions or the artistic expression happen in the moment was really where I found um, my niche. So I decided to explore that and applied and got the um, orchestral management apprenticeship at Juilliard. And so that upon graduating the following academic year, I moved to New York City and spent a year basically in the heat of orchestra at Juilliard, which is quite quite the task. You know, they're they're fast moving and there's a different concert going on every two weeks. Uh, we get to perform at Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall. So that really allowed me to test whether I was enjoying that side of education because it still very much is an educational position. It's just more what the what the experience feels like more so than what what you're telling the students. And I was sure that that's where I wanted to, to remain, thankfully. And so the I that was a one year position. So um, that finished spring of 2019. And then that transitioned into a position where I am now at the Manus School of Music, still in New York City. Um, I'm on year two and I'm the ensemble operations coordinator. So I do a lot of the stuff that I did at Juilliard, um, which is personnel and operations management of setting up rehearsals, um, managing performances, working on rosters, um, all sorts of things like that. And then this year in particular, with a lot of that not being the same <laughs> in the past 10 year or so, 10 months, um, I've transitioned more into curricular work, redesigning how, how music happens like this, and also mm -hmm. what which areas we can we can really focus on to benefit the students uh, going forward. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, my follow up to you is um, as a stage manager, either at Ithaca or in your work at Juilliard, um, was there any particular moment or artist you worked with? I guess, I guess two parts of that. Were you always working with um, faculty or were they also professional groups that came into both places? And was there a moment where you were kind of behind the scenes or in that work going, this is just so exciting or this concert is so amazing. I'm so glad I got to be stage manager for that. Like, was there anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure when Carlvin goes, he'll have a few too. But for me, um, the a couple of moments actually, it was really well. First of all, at Juilliard and at Manus, as well as um, a summer and seasonal program, I do the Perlman Music Program. We bring in a lot of visiting or touring artists as conductors. That's a big that's a big uh, standard thing, especially in New York City is you'll have orchestra cycles um, or ensembles in any way that bring in people who might know the repertoire or a particular project that you're doing rather than having it be the same, um, either a professor, like a director of orchestral studies or um, just the same, you know, conducting students. It really is a mix of one minute you can have the professor who teaches conducting, the next week you could have someone who basically goes around the world and is, um, performing the repertoire that, that you are with them. So it's a really exciting moment. And, and certainly I felt that 
at two. <laughs> I felt that once at Juilliard when I worked with Marin Alsop. Uh, it was a month into the into the job or a month into the school year, and it was Carnegie Hall. So we got to go into Carnegie Hall, and Marin Alsop came and we did Shostakovich five, which was pretty pretty amazing. Um, and the second one was the following summer uh, when I started at the Perlman Music Program out in Long Island. Um, just working with Itzhak Perlman and his wife every day is something that <laughs> was, yeah. it's, I, I kind of pinch myself every, every few <laughs> weeks, but it, it for, at this point, they feel like an extension of my family. So mm -hmm. it's a nice, it's a nice world to be in. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you. Yeah. And Calvin, so tell us your journey. Um, and, and I know you, you said you just got off a recording session at Juilliard. So, um, you know, from wherever you started to that recording session a few minutes ago, what, what's going on? Uh, yeah, so I'm Carlvin. I was born and raised in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, I went to school in Maine, Colby College, small liberal arts school in Waterville, Maine. I initially went in to study physics and philosophy, but then that switched to music and then a very, very hefty physics minor, <laughs> which means I was one, one class away from getting a double major. Um, but during my time at Kobe, I kind of rotated and helped maintain a couple positions. First year I did, uh, I was a concert usher and then got promoted to the head concert usher. So handled a lot of scheduling um, and coordinating uh, setups or helping uh, conductors with setups. And then I was asked to be the assistant orchestra manager for the Colby Symphony Orchestra. And then I, at the same time, was also a teaching assistant for physics. And then uh, the next year I became the orchestra manager. And that was kind of my full role after that. So a lot of managing, uh, making these large orchestra concerts happen. We had like Carmina Burana and all these other um, pieces. So that was a lot of fun. I was also involved in a lot of kind of extracurriculars. I was in jazz band. I was a percussionist in the orchestra also as the manager. Sometimes they asked me to, to wing into the orchestra. Uh, I did, uh, I played percussion in wind ensemble. What else I did? I was a radio host uh, for a couple months at one point, college wow. radio. And uh, I also did some research in uh, physics lab, laser lab, which was cool. And then I graduated in 2015 and kind of tried to figure out what I wanted to do because I didn't have, I had no idea my last year what I wanted to do with the music degree or anything regarding it. And as I slowly started to just like think about what kind of uh, pathways I could take, eventually I settled, oh, maybe higher education and conservatories would be a nice move. So then that's when I started looking specifically at different uh, colleges around kind of the Northeast region. And eventually a Juilliard position opened up and I applied for the production library, library manager position, which is the one I've been doing for the past five years. And I've, it was a new administration. So uh, my colleagues, uh, Wynton Marsalis, Dr. Aaron Flagg and Anika Adelifu. Um, so I was the last kind of piece in their, in their administration. And uh, I've been doing that since, and I think since 2017, sorry, my dates are all fuzzy. Since 2017, I've been involved with the Perlman Music Program as a, a chamber music workshop and also their Sarasota residency a couple times. Um, so that's kind of a different vein entirely than me doing all the things that I do in my jazz position. It's very similar in a lot of areas in terms of uh, dealing with artists and fa or faculty, dealing with student young musicians, uh, and uh, it's a very different vein, but both are very rewarding. And it's not at that, that position at Perlman wasn't, is not as intensive as my Juilliard position, considering the one I currently have, I have to wear many hats typically because I'm doing production and uh, handling our big band and small ensemble catalog and all that stuff. So it's been rewarding since this pandemic has hit it's been a massive recalibration of a lot of things that we've done. So new protocols to make sure everyone's safe and secure, frequent testing, uh, making sure people are socially distanced when they're performing, and then piecing together schedules and we've shifted our whole academic school year. So it's been a big adjustment for almost the simplest things can kind of become uh, more involved than typical. So it's been an adjustment, but it's been rewarding for the students, which is ultimately what matters the most. And the faculty are also pleased. So that's where I'm at right now. And yes, the, the recording session that's, that's just happened is kind of the, is actually the first one 
for the for a couple that we're doing the next two weeks before spring break hits. So we have a couple projects that are happening. That's really cool. My um my follow up for you is this um your love of music and physics. When 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 you were an undergrad did you decide I, I I'm going to do this music thing? It sounded like you graduated and you weren't quite sure, but did you ever consider doing anything with physics or was it always some kind of music at some point after all the work you did as an undergrad in that, in that role? Uh, so I, I honestly, the time, my time going between the two was very kind of uh, stressful and tumultuous, just having to put the hours into practice, but then also do the job, but then also get my problem sets done. Um, and I wasn't the perfect student by any means but I definitely gave energy to the things that kind of intrigued me the most. And the music classes were the ones that really felt like engaging and I spent extra time just going on my own researching these things. So then I kind of knew that, oh, this is something that I wanna do more. So I was fortunate enough to be far enough in my physics track by that point that I was able to take a semester of just music and art classes. And once I did that, that kind of, I think that was my uh, fall semester, junior year, that kind of set the trajectory for me being like, okay, maybe music's something that I'd really, really love to do. Um, but the physics element uh, or that kind of scientific curiosity and uh, skill set definitely comes into play a little bit, but I kind of teeter back and forth between the two. I'll go through phases where I'm very, very like focused on creative things and, you know, playing instruments and making things up. And then it might shift to me reading books on old scientists or dabbling with coding and things like that. So it's kind of this weird kind of back and forth <laughs> that I have in my life. So it seems. Very cool. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for all of that. Um, so just to kind of go a little bit further, um, we heard a little bit about your each of your journeys to where you are today in arts management. Um, you know, if you could talk maybe a little bit more about um, what are some other career paths that, um, you know, can can exist within arts management, um, either around you in your organizations or um, or even beyond that. Um, so why don't we start with Jeff? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly found this when I graduated and sort of towards the, you know, my last semester or two. It, the more you dive into the term arts management, the bigger it gets. So it's like, it goes from, oh, it's maybe this and this occupation. But when you do your research and you look at, you know, if your interest is looking at master's programs, you see how generalized it, it actually is at that stage. And, and what I found, I knew I wanted to be in education. So I knew um, that you know, starting to look beyond in the places that might have more elaborate um, ensemble programs, you know, things that require staff, as well as teachers. It's not just, you know, a middle school or a high school teacher where they have to basically do anything and everything all at once by themselves, which I is constantly impressive to me. Um, but really seeing what the the structure behind what I just did was, you know, spending four years being an orchestra student, you don't consider who's around you doing the stuff that, that you're sort of getting on stage to do, you know, you see your class, you go, you worry about other stuff. Um, and so really diving into that is where just the higher education portion was, you know, sort of showed itself to me, it was like there's concert management, which I mentioned, you know, setting up a stage. And then there's also, um, those who are working the rehearsals at many schools like Juilliard and Manus, we also have the staff and student crew who worry about rehearsals and making a plan for, you know, keeping time, making sure that you don't go over 90 minutes per, you know, rehearsal block mm -hmm. and having the, you know, so there's those kinds of jobs, but there's also, and this is more common in larger organizations that might not be, you know, university affiliated, um, things like, working on annual gifts and money, basically all the, all the getting of the money, uh, box office, all, anything that could involve youth programs. Um, Manus Prep is one of those or Juilliard Pre-College uh, summer programs, anything that like, even Carnegie Hall has this huge infrastructure within it that could, you know, human resources could look exactly the same as any other human resource position, but it's at Carnegie Hall. 
So it's really all of those could fit into arts management. And I think finding your niche within that, it's almost easier to look at yourself and say, what do I really enjoy doing? And then seeing where, where that happens in an organization. And for me, that was making concerts and rehearsals flow as seamlessly as possible and as effectively as, as the students want. And they should see that too, you know, finding, see, seeing that process is just as important as, you know, if, if you're not interested in it, you still want to see it and respect it for sure. That's great. Thank you for that. You know, I'm curious, um, could you describe what um, a typical day for you looks like in your position? Yeah, so I'll do like two phases because there's a normal, then there's this year, <laughs> and then I'll be back to normal. But the the how I started out my first year and sort of what the job description is as an ensemble operations coordinator is to, you know, it's a rehearsal day. Those are usually more exciting, as we all know. Um, but you, you try to get there and our process that we do is get to work. First thing I do is print out uh, rosters for the, for the rehearsals that are happening. We usually do two or three at a time or at once. Mm -hmm. So we've got, you know, it looks like a fancy spreadsheet, but you know, we've got divided by instrument and as laid out as possible for an orchestra, but sometimes we have wind ensemble and you know, contemporary ensembles have those set up as well as stage plots that I've made ahead of time. Um, I try to do this as early as I can and, you know, struggle to do it in Word or if I <laughs> if I have some extra time, I make them look a little nicer. Um, so I have, I usually print about five of those each and our rehearsals are not until the afternoon. So I've got some time, lots of email. We all love email um, as well as trying to get ahead on bigger projects. So for planning an offsite concert, then there's a lot more involved with booking movers um, finding good times for um, the venue itself to receive your equipment and everything based on their schedule, especially if a place like Alice Tully Hall or Carnegie, where they do some a different thing every night. So they're going to move in, move out every day. So you have to get everything in and out in the same day of the concert, which is pretty crazy. So that takes that takes some time and some planning. So it's usually longer term planning in the morning. And then rehearsal happens. An hour before rehearsal, I go to the space and I've already scheduled i'm the manager of our student crew so i've put ahead of time you know we've got these three people to show up at an hour prior to the rehearsal and i've got my stage plot i say okay any questions go for it and then it runs to the other space <laughs> do the same thing with that crew um and then that hour beforehand usually about 45 minutes it's pretty quiet everything's set up you know, i hope at least a half an hour in advance um and then we connect with the director of that particular rehearsal. They're usually there before most of the students. Um, make sure that we have a game plan for the rehearsal, that we know what their goals are. Um, we lay out the approximate plan. If there's any change, especially in personnel in the ensemble, if they have like the piece with 80 players is happening first, and then we trickle down to the, the piece that's happening with eight players. So we make that little plan and then at that point, students are trickling in. If anyone's forgotten music, that just happens three times a day, I think. <laughs> but on, on the average day, um, it, it's usually just a single person. And thankfully, we've got our office right there and our library right there. Um, so you run back. We have extra parts, which we've got as part of our, our preparation process. It's usually just copies, but we, we do what we can. Um, and then as things get going, one of the main aspects of our job, which is, it seems easy, but it can be complicated with visiting artists, especially, is making sure you start on time. And it means don't begin tuning on time. It means tune a minute before and you play on time. So, or you at least the full two and a half hours, like one o'clock to 3.30 is the director's time. And so that's, that's really our job as well to make sure that we're on schedule and then um, we plan for break and you know usually 80 85 minutes and then we walk in me walking in is usually a signal to the director that we're getting close to time if they're if there's someone who doesn't have a watch um, and then break happens break is about 15 minutes and then we're off to the races for for part two and then Usually after that, it's a little more email and then the day is done, unless we have an evening 
rehearsal. And then we, we sort of round up and do attendance after the fact. We make little notes and say if anyone was late or if anyone was absent that day. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of running around, but it, it's fun. It, the day goes quick, for sure. That's great. And I'm glad to hear that we're not the only place where students forget their music. So that's a, that's, that's a comforting <laughs> thought. So <laughs> Not just at school either. I, I, can, I can bet that one. Not just at schools. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't we go uh, Carlvin and then Kelly. So the same question, um, just quickly, anything to add about um, uh, career paths and arts management and then a quick follow up on what your day typically looks like. Uh, yeah, so for potential career paths, uh, kind of touching off what Jeff said, just knowing what kind of interests you, you know, for me, it took it didn't take too long for me to pinpoint that, oh, I like supporting these things behind the scenes. It's fun being able to pull it all together and then watch this concert happen and then have it go away and then be like, I can't believe we did three concerts in like four days kind of a thing. Uh, so at least from my experiences, conservatories or uh, small nonprofit organizations are pretty good bets for uh, giving you a wide array of skills that you can gain, but also a massive impact that you can contribute to. Because uh, even my, my current roommate, we went to college together, we're old bandmates and friends, but I'm in kind of like, you know, conservatory jazz, went in Marsalis, uh, true roots to the music and, or roots to the music, I'm not gonna say true roots. And then my uh, roommate works in a free jazz arts organization, uh, in the Lower East Side, New York, and it's a small operation, but they put on massive uh, performances with all these amazing musicians, and I've volunteered and helped there. So seeing how other nonprofit organizations and small clubs around the city, uh, how they operate. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can go, and it's not, um, it's, I don't think most people recognize how many moving parts go behind making an organization run. So people might not think of, of, a, uh, of a, a higher education institution as a place that would have a lot of opportunities, but we have marketing, we have human resources, there's the administrative staff directly with that. There's, there's a lot of different avenues that you can go into and if you're coming straight out of college, at least one kind of tip that I will give is that where you start does not mean where you'll end up. You'll see a lot of people coming from non-traditional backgrounds into music and arts or coming from music and arts and going to do I don't know, software engineering for the next six years. So I, I feel like there's a lot of pressure on people to feel like they have to get this golden egg job first out. And once you go there, like, I don't know what's gonna happen next. And it's, it's okay to go in, like dive into the water but also make sure you maintain that curiosity and that you connect with all your other colleagues around you. Because I know plenty of other people that work at Juilliard or work in other arts organizations who managed to branch into something else that they didn't know they were like doing, like recording um, or, or uh, going into marketing. And they started off in somewhere completely unrelated, but they were like, hey, I wanna learn about this stuff. Do you guys need extra help? And so where you start getting like getting into the to the to the uh, room is great, but make sure that you keep on exploring avenues for where you want to grow as you're in there. Um, and what was the or what the typical day to day is like? So in the pre COVID times, uh, we ran a lot <laughs> more concerts, we have six small ensembles, we're now at seven this year, but or uh, started this year, or was planned to start this year. And when COVID hit, they didn't, ha they haven't had a chance to play in a traditional sense. Um, they each, I believe, do about six or eight concerts a, a full academic year. And then we have our big band, the Juilliard Jazz Orchestra. They perform about 10 different concerts throughout the season. And so a lot of, all of that touches my specific office since I handle the production. So um, stage plots, that's me communicating with the production department in, our, in stages or in different venues around the city making sure that the equipment's right, checking with the faculty, checking with the students to see if there's anything that's um, odd that they might need for a piece. Like, oh, the, horn, the horns need a pedal board for this repertoire we're playing. So do you know any sources for that? Um, so my job kind of is very, very flexible on a day-to-day -day basis. So normally when I come in, it's kind of seeing what things uh, 
I need to get done that are kind of the most urgent that day because no normally with jazz musicians they they message and send emails or requests at all hours of the day so sometimes you come in at nine or ten and then there's like 20 messages waiting for you when there weren't that night and then you have to sift through them uh, and then there's also kind of that short-term planning and getting those things out the way and then planning more long-term for bigger projects that are coming like if we're in the pre-COVID times, if we're doing an international trip to Brazil, um, communicating with them what kind of instruments we need and making sure that that's clear with them. Uh, or if we're doing, uh, sometimes we have three or four concerts from different ensembles, but in different areas around the city or in close proximity of each other. Um, so making sure that that's taken care of with either my work study students or communicating with my other colleagues in different departments to make sure that whatever is needed, if I can't physically be there to help, that it's getting done. Um, but now with the COVID hitting, a lot of it has become, or a lot of my day-to-day -day or scheduling is less so much about those ad hoc requests popping up a lot because it's people are, are teaching on Zoom for the most part. Uh, though we're, our department is doing some, uh, or is doing live in-person rehearsals and recording opportunities for the students and a couple of live streams that, we're, that we've done and have continued to go on. Um, and so there's still that element of planning the long term kind of projects, but now with how everything is set up, everything really has to be kind of detailed and made sure that you kind of cover all the gaps because it's not as there's not as much wiggle room as before, you know, like, at least for me, in terms of managing spaces that's doubled in terms of how many I'm, I'm now managing. So just making sure that there's a system in place to make sure these things are going this way um, and making sure nothing slips through the cracks is generally the day-to-day. -day. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I, my my experience is a little bit, a little bit different because um, I've been involved in, it's mostly been in event planning, um, not in higher education. So uh, background uh, mostly with um, conferences and coordinating large events in borrowed spaces, not using spaces that are, are part of our organization, um, which I know you guys do as well. But, um, you know, there are, every state has professional organizations that do conferences. Usually they have administrative staff like you were saying, uh, you know, you could have a director, you can have a, a business person, a marketing person. So there's lots of different ways that you can get involved um, in uh, arts administration, even at that, um, like the, the, the state level. Um, Midwest Clinic is a little bit different because it's an, it's an international conference. So it's one large event that happens once a year. And so a lot of the planning and the preparation we do is thinking about that, that that whole year trajectory. So every day looks very different because the needs uh, change as you progress throughout the year. And I really liked that. I like that aspect of having a lot of variety um, and being able to interact with all the different components of an event from the people at the, uh, the event space. Um, we use McCormick Place as our primary um, place to host the conference. So dealing with all of their staff and then also working with all of our exhibitors and sponsors and working with our board to decide uh, curriculum and our clinics and our performing ensembles and having that whole ecosystem kind of in my purview and trying to make sure that all of the pieces are staying on track um, makes for a very diverse job. Um, as far as uh, getting, getting to that point, um, I didn't have any idea that any of this existed when I was a student um, and undergrad or even really truly when I was working um, as a teacher. Uh, it was I was a consumer more than anything. I was going to these things and um, I was given the opportunity to get involved as a volunteer and I jumped on that because I, I love to try new things, learn new things. And that was really where my eyes were open to um, this whole new world. Um, and it's uh, I think that that'd be my best advice is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so just being open to opportunities, um, you just, you, you just never know what kind of experiences that you're going to have that are going to shape or change your, your vision of what, what means, you know, what brings value to your life and what your passions are. Um, my passion was, uh, it is still is, uh, it's supporting, uh, personal growth. I love to see people, um, growing 
being a teacher made so much sense for that, right? Because you're investing in those kids every day. But just because I'm not teaching anymore, now I'm helping support teachers in essence. Um, it doesn't mean that I gave up on that passion. It's just finding another way to do it. And uh, so I think if you have a really strong idea of what your passion is, uh, and then go sample all of the different things, be a consumer, you know, uh, then you can really start to see what's out there. Um, I, we, the three of us don't have, the five of us don't have an exhaustive list of all that's out there because I'm sure there's things that we're not even aware of, but you may discover in your journey. Um, all that to say, uh, my job itself, uh, it's, it's equal parts, some mundane and some exciting. Um, obviously, uh, COVID has changed a lot of our day to days. Um, but I think the common thread among all jobs, especially when you're dealing with lots of people is communication. So a lot of my day is communicating, whether it's getting information from people so that I can do my job, or um, giving them information so that they can do their, their job. Um, a lot of it is communicating. I do a lot of long-term and short-term project management. So a short-term project could be something like a marketing campaign or uh, a special um, uh, uh, application timeline. You know, maybe we're doing a, a program uh, and we have a, um, a, a window for app accepting applications. So setting up that process. Um, Long term, obviously, is you know looking at the future of our organization and trying to establish um, uh, processes and protocols to help ensure that sustainability. A lot of that has to do with budgeting and fundraising. Um, so there's a lot of business components to the job, um, and then uh, logistic coordination. That's huge. So thinking through you know what what do you just what do you need to make something happen, and then making sure that all of those pieces are in line. Um, and it takes a lot of going back to the well. So, you, you know, you, you start a process, you kind of chip away at it. And then as you get further down, you start to narrow down to the, the details, but you start kind of with your big overall goal and then you narrow it down. And so that's a lot of it. And then this year, especially has been a lot of research. Um, so we went from a live event to a virtual event and, and something our organization had never been done before, something I'd never done before. So just finding out what resources and tools are out there has been a lot of my job, just talking to people who are in a similar situation and figuring out what they've done and trying to support one another through that has been a large part of my job this year. But I think it's a healthy thing. We, we've grown a lot because of it. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my, my day to day. It's very different every day. That's really great. And I, I, can't even imagine what it was like to get a new job and then immediately have to pivot and turn this historic in-person event to completely virtual. Um, yeah. So congratulations on that alone. I thought I thought it went great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. Um, yeah, like I'm hearing some really interesting things, and I just to summarize, I, I so many of you talked about volunteering as a way to continue to learn and figure out where you want to be, and you all seem to have done a little bit of that. I, I kind of feel like you do like grand coordination, and you have to have um, you have to be detail oriented. Like it sounds like in all of your jobs, like the details are really important as you communicate um, about your event or your rehearsal, your day, or whatever's happening. Um, so the next question, there's, there's sort of like four more questions that are sort of similar. And I'm gonna ask Carlvin to answer it first. Um, but the, the specific question was, if I wanna manage a professional orchestra, um, what experience do I need now? Or, or if I wanna manage an, any kind of um, musical organizations. But I think what the students wanna know is, you know, are there classes in college? Are there experiences they should seek out? Um, a couple of you talked about you, you being stage manager type folks in your undergraduate um, time. So what, what thoughts do you have, Carl, then about, you know, if someone wants to go into organizational management, what, what do they need to know now? Uh, so, I mean, kind of, you touched upon it very well, detail orientation or being very detail oriented is very, very important. Um, eventually, no matter what scale of project, kind of like Kelly said, you're going to have to have the big picture and then you're going to have to keep on bringing it down to the small things because eventually what ends up impacting or what the people that are performing music and the audience feel are gonna be those those details. Um, and if you miss a bunch of them, you're gonna <laughs> rub everyone the wrong way. So any opportunity for a job to kind of give you that or a, or a class that involves that is very helpful. Um, for me, like music theory was probably a good kind of example for that. I use that in my library kind of hat within it, within uh, my role. 
but outside of just using it for reading scores or being able to know what an alto clef is, <laughs> um, it would be, uh, you have to kind of know how to take constraints and then figure out how to make something out of that and then keep, re keep a, I don't say refactor, but keep on uh, adjusting it until it reaches the optimal view of what you want. And kind of a skill set like that is transfer transferable from a lot of different courses that you can take as a music major. Um, also, this is kind of not a hard skill in, in uh, exactly, but communication, as Kelly said, that's a skill that you can always work on and always get better at. And you'd be surprised at how much people don't think about it as something that you can build upon. Like you're not born with a set or you might be more acclimated towards a certain level of how you communicate, but you can always build upon it. Um, and so even if you're the best recording engineer the world has ever seen, if you're disrespectful to everyone that comes into your session, if you talk to any faculty member, they'll be like, I didn't like that recording engineer. They kept rubbing me the wrong way. The recording sounded great, but I never worked with them again because of this. And then they'll be like, oh, there was someone that's like, oh, the recording was okay, but they're so like, they're so peaceful. They make the whole experience such a breeze compared to these other ones. And who do you think is gonna end up being asked for more opportunities or being referred to more opportunities? So making sure that um, you're able to process what people are saying to you. So listening before you just start snapping to things. So waiting, making sure that you get everything that, that they're, they're thinking about and then asking questions to kind of prime them to give you more. And then from there you go on. And then as you go through the process, make sure to touch back and make sure that whatever you're working on doesn't end up becoming your own vision completely separate from what this artist or this guest artist or these students were thinking of. So that's something that can be that can be built upon either through working or uh, and pretty much any job is gonna have to involve that. You're gonna be part of a team and you're gonna have to communicate and you're gonna have to accomplish a task. Um, but in terms of coursework, uh, my experience is a little different because I know what it's like to do science, like scientific research stuff and being in a lab for four hours and doing these things. But uh, that experience to me definitely, I, it, it gave me the ability to problem solve. And so any courses that you think will give you that advantage, it could be a philosophy course because that definitely <laughs> expanded my mind on how to like look at something and puzzle piece things together. It could be a physics course, it could be a math course. It might be a course you care nothing about but there might be little mechanisms or little things that help make the course easy that you can then take to other areas. So always be on the lookout for, for that, those meta kind of parts of it. Like a calculus class is great. Like, oh yeah, it's, I, I don't wanna have to learn these nifty rules I'm never gonna use again. But if you think about it like towards the next level, it's, oh, someone's giving you these rules to be able to problem solve and break these things down with little shortcuts. And you have to work to make that more ingrained and then you can go from there. So if you're if you're able to kind of shift the classes that you don't want to take or don't like to take and kind of see what the teachers, why the curriculum set up this way, which is something I didn't do when I was in college, it took me learning more things outside of college to see that kind of see why things are flowing the way they are in a course that'll definitely help you kind of see like, oh, this is what the teacher thinks is important as a skill outside of just the constraints of this literature course or something like that. So that kind of perspective is really important to try and like home, I think. That's such a great, I, I so appreciate your answer. And, um, and I think as an undergrad, sometimes you're just so worried about getting through the day, getting through the stuff, doing the homework. It's hard to think about that meta reason for that course or how it's been structured or how someone's presenting it. And that's just really great advice. Thank you. Jeff. Yeah, I mean, Carlin, you got so many great points. I completely agree. And I think what really I've noticed and what, I mean, I'm just a, a few years out of undergrad, so I'm not gonna act like I, I have even approached getting to an ideal place on this, but what I what I found almost after I graduated and what I wish I'd done more, um, whether it be with a job during my undergrad or which I was lucky to have, or just being there and appreciating what it's like to be at an arts and performing arts institution is that you have so many instances and so many settings to absorb and I think I, I look at absorbing and consuming, which Kelly mentioned of like, you have all these assets around you. You have your friends, you don't know where your friends are gonna end up. And you also don't know, you know, it's easy to see a teacher, even your private teacher as just a teacher, someone you see once a week. And you don't 
necessarily remember all the time that all of these people got exactly where they are. They've had a whole life behind them. So that in itself, in your everyday, at the very least, those are people who are going to want to share exactly what we're doing right now. You know, they they appreciate where they've been, what they've done, and they're passing it on to you. And, and to be in a class where everyone's had their own unique path, no one's no one's gotten to that classroom the same way. So finding that with the people who may be professors, they might be staff like me, they might be your friends, finding finding those reasons to expand, sort of what Carlin said, expand your your way of thinking about why and just being where you are. And the second aspect, which I've certainly noticed living in New York City the past couple of years is just going and consuming a live concert is one thing. You're there for the music and it's wonderful. We all know, we all wanna go see music at a high level, but start to notice the workings around it. Who, who like between pieces, what's happening? intermission, what's going on. And then a huge aspect, which I know is not entirely common depending on the region, but open rehearsals are incredible. The New York Phil does this all the time. You can go to uh, 10 a.m., one of their rehearsals that they're having, you can just, sometimes they're even free. I think there's like a few dollars, but you go in, you get to see them, you know, they're the New York Phil. They can probably play the music pretty well, but you can really see the activity around when it's not an event because there's there's this cohort of people that works when it's event time. They're on it. There are people doing box office stuff. There's dinner being served. There's ushers. There's all this stuff. There's the you know the stage crew and staff are all on high gear. But when it's in the morning, when it's it's a place of work, you know these musicians are showing up and they call it work, which is still weird for me to think about. <laughs> even though I call it work, I guess, but I'm not playing. But the to, to see what a regular day could be like is a fascinating thing. And, and I have done this a couple of times. You reach out to somebody, you send an email expressing interest in, in that. You get to shadow, I shadowed the personnel manager of the New York Bill one day, and it was just, it wasn't a concert day. It was just a day. <laughs> and so to see what a day is like and, and what, going to the office at a Lincoln Center or at just a regional rehearsal. Maybe they meet once a week. What, what does it take in that room? And what does it take for each of those individuals to get there? And, and just ex sort of, again, what Carlvin mentioned, thinking of what you've done for so much of your life, slightly at a different angle, mm -hmm. gives you infinitely more information. And I think that's, that's the little glimpse that I was able to get at, in undergrad that affected just my mindset going into the same classes. Not even to say that you need to take anything specific. It's just finding finding exactly where the mind can take you, and you'll you'll realize that you're seeing different sort of different colors everywhere. It's really cool. I don't know about the rest of you, but Jeff, you're making me just be really excited for the next time we can all go to a concert and maybe have dinner. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that was. Oh. I know I should have saved it. I should have saved it for the summer when we're like well, on the road back, but that's great. Know. Kelly, thank you. Yeah. Um, so undergrad was a, it was a couple of years back for me. Um, but I, uh, I think that it, you can't underestimate the similarities that you have in uh, just a music education class coming up with a curriculum. I mean, that's basically what we're doing. You know, you, you, when you think about your, your lesson plan for the day, for the week, for the month, preparing for the concert, where the, you want those kids in a year, where you want those kids in three years, five years, 12 years, you know, that's basically what we're doing. So, you know, you're practicing those skills right now in an undergrad. And um, as somebody who came out of undergrad and I went into teaching right away and did that for many years, a lot of the skills that I learned that I use now, I actually learned while I was teaching um, business skills, uh, how to manage a budget, how to communicate with people who were more experienced or older than you. Um, I was you know, 22 and uh, a lot of the parents of my students could be my parents. They could have been my parents and learning how to communicate with them. Those are skills I learned on the job. Um, 
uh, I got really involved with the, um, the arts organizations there. Like I was, um, I was involved with our ASTA program, our, our MEA program. Um, I, I helped with soul and ensemble. I did everything that I could as a teacher, um, just doing what I wanted to do, what I was interested in. And so many of the skills that I got while I was doing those things are things that I use now. Um, so I guess the point of that is you are gonna be learning something along the way no matter where you are in your journey that could you know greatly impact what you're going to do in the future you just may not realize it and so um just like uh, you know uh, like i said before just trying different things uh getting involved in a lot of different things too expose you to skill sets that you wouldn't know otherwise um i think that one of the 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 areas that i didn't realize at the time how valuable it was going to be, but has really paid off is I invested a lot in developing leadership skills. Um, I took a leadership in the arts class and leading isn't about being the boss. Leading is about guiding people on a journey or helping them achieve their goals. And um, that's basically what we're all doing. And, and it's, it's, it's a servant leadership mindset where you are doing by serving, you're helping clear a pathway so that people experience success, whether it's coordinating a concert or um, planning a, a, um, a festival or, or, or an event. Um, it's all kind of the same thing and understanding how to motivate people, how to inspire people, how to uh, speak to people in a way that, um, that gets them on board with your vision and, and your goals is that paid off hugely as a teacher, but it's a, something that I've used, um, that skill set, uh, something that I've used all along the way um, and something I continue to invest in. So reading, going to workshops, learning from people who are killing it in their lives right now, like, like uh, Jeff mentioned, um, you know, ask, ask somebody who you admire, somebody who's doing what you wanna do really, really well say, hey, can I just hang with you for a day? Um, more than likely, they'll say yes. Uh, I had the opportunity to do that. I shadowed the um, NAM Foundation Group mm -hmm. for one of their summer conferences. And I was like, you know, I'll file papers. I don't even care. Just, I wanna be in your space to see how you do what you do. And I learned so much from that experience. Um, they didn't pay me. Again, I volunteered, but the the reward absolutely was the knowledge that I gained from that. And um, people who are doing it really well, they want other people to do it really well too. So they'll absolutely invest in you in that way. Um, so yeah, you can get a lot from your undergrad. Don't miss out on those opportunities, but also keep in mind that you're not going to come out a fully formed human. <laughs> you know, you're not going to have all the answers every step. There's going to be a gap between what you know and what you need to know. And life has a way of providing you the resources to fill in those gaps. So, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up if you don't have it all figured out, but definitely go out there and be proactive and creative about finding those solutions. So, so great to hear you say that. And, and the, this whole idea about servant leadership and, and, and just hearing the three of you talk about your stories um, and sort of guessing your approximate ages. I imagine in your jobs, you talk to people who are older than you, like as Kelly mentioned, talking to parents and guardians, often you're talking to people older than you. And in some cases, people who may have really large artistic egos um, and so you have to be really, uh, um, I, you know, I imagine that can be a challenge at times. So um, if, if you want to share that, uh, any stories, feel free. But I know Anthony has a, a follow up right now to, to ask you to just just to see all of your faces when she mentioned ego, just go mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yep, I'm thinking of that one person right now. So um, <laughs> So um, just real quick as we're wrapping up here, um, you know, when I took over this, uh, my position here at the University of Illinois three years ago, um, one of the things that was advertised was um, uh, coordinating social media, which I will tell you, as I went through my uh, undergraduate music education program and my master's and my doctorate, we never once discussed. Um, and so I'm curious um, if it was a similar situation for you all and, and maybe what social media chops you need in your positions. Um, and then again, as we're wrapping up here, maybe like one last one last thing that you wanna share or something that comes to mind along the way. So why don't we start with Kelly and then we'll go to Carl, Vin and Jeff. Um, yeah, so I was in college when Facebook first launched. 
So <laughs> that gives you an idea. <laughs> yeah. Same. So I, I had to have a, a .edu email yes. address. Yeah. yeah. I, yes. That's yeah. why my Gmail is so awesome because I also was in college when that was launched as well. So I was one of the OG Google users. And I made Anthony record this because I wasn't sure how to press that button. So <laughs> that's what hold on. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, you know, I know, I know people who are, uh, you know, in their sixties and killing it at social media, you know, there's not an age, you know, it, it limit to, you know, who can be amazing at it or who can be mildly awful at it. Um, but <laughs> there, uh, yeah, social media has absolutely become more of the marketing stream. And I guess that's something that, um, I personally am working on a lot. Um, and, uh, and this is one of those areas where I'm asking a lot of questions and I'm talking to people to find out more because that's become more of my job. Um, in my previous position, we had a person that did that, uh, which was great. Um, somebody who uh, was able to focus on that all the time. But, you know, as you know, jobs are fluid and, and roles can change. And so now that's more my role for now. Um, and hopefully we can move on to a bigger, you know, platform or, or we can expand to the point where we have somebody who has more dedicated interest in that. But yeah, uh, social media is not going anywhere. Um, it is evolving, however, um, how it's used is changing constantly. And so uh, it, it's, it's, not, um, it's not just social, right? It's, it's a way of life and, it's, and it is one of the strongest marketing arms that you can use not only to communicate with people, but to build new relationships and help um, support your network and your community. So it's very multifaceted. Um, that's, yeah, I, I'm probably the worst person to start with to ask that question, but yeah. Um, no, it's all great. You, you asked something else and I don't remember what it was because I'm so thrown off by social media. Oh, 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 no worries at all. It's just if there was um, anything else about, you know, maybe what you do or your path that you wanted to share with our students. Well, I mean, for what it's worth, um, I really hope that you guys come to the Midwest Clinic. Um, and if you see me, say hi. Yeah, and if, if you have any questions, my door is always open. I had so many wonderful people who invested in me um, and I am always willing to do the same for anybody else who's, who's interested in finding out more. If, if you wanna hang out and, and see what's behind the curtain, I'd be more than happy to have you do that. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we're all in this together. So if anything I can do to support you guys, I'm, I'm happy to do that. That's great. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, yeah, so on the social media angle, <laughs> I'm kind of in Kelly's uh, group. I mean, I, I, I graduated college 2015, if that's the giveaway. Um, and back then I was way more at way more active on Facebook and on the Instagrams. But for my, my position in my role, I don't do any social media. We have a whole uh, public affairs department that handles those elements. Um, but on my social media, I do follow a lot of artists that we've either worked with or that I know personally, students who are coming up and you can see their, their mature, not their maturity, but their growth uh, as they go through navigating how they're going to use social media because it could start off as kind of a joke and like I'm playing like this funny lick because it's funny and then it might shift one day to like oh these are serious like lessons that they're trying to impart on people on these things so just at least having some type of awareness <laughs> of what the scene within the realm that you're in looks like is helpful even if you're not actively required to to be a participant uh, within it but if someone would need me to go on Instagram and kind of update and do that stuff I, I mean, I could learn it, but it's not one of my strongest skill sets. Um, and my, my peek into that world is what my roommate actually does because he's their marketing kind of, um, he's their what is it, marketing manager. So he handles all their social media accounts and, and uh, the, uh, the uh, per promotions for their festivals or their events. Uh, and it's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes there for something that looks like a simple email that just come out. There's a lot of um, little, gathering of information, making sure that it's on brand, which is a big thing. You're not representing yourself when you're logged on to this arts organization. You must speak as a member of the, or speak for the brand. Um, so being aware of what avenues you can learn to be able to do that is important because you can learn it from copywriting. Like there's a lot of free copywriting courses or tutorials, um, but there's also a lot of resources on how to 
start social media. So there's so many avenues out there. If you if you don't have, if you don't feel the most comfortable with navigating it, it's pretty intuitive, thankfully, because as simple as these interfaces are, there's a lot of very smart people making very complex things happen behind the scenes. So you're being given uh, a tool that you don't thankfully have to start from scratch. So you can learn it. And no matter what age you are, you'll, you'll be able to navigate it. Because I've definitely seen people start using Instagram and they're in their 60s. And it turns out growing to such an extent that you're like, wow. <laughs> and I'm sure they may, might be asking people for help and looking things up on their own and figuring it out. But it's a fun little journey that I've seen some people go through. So be, being open to that is great. And so the second uh, remark for like kind of the last thing, to Kelly's point, yeah, I'm also open. Um, <laughs> I please, I will give the disclaimer that sometimes my schedule gets very, very jam packed. So a little leniency in my response time, please. <laughs> but I will get back to you. So it's not something where I just, it never comes back. I'll get back to you. Um, but outside of that, one of the biggest skills that, that I've learned is appreciated by other people because it's something that I tend to do kind of naturally. Uh, or I don't, maybe I learned it. I assume it's natural because I don't remember consciously learning it. It's just being able to kind of have a grace under pressure in a sense. So when something might happen that upsets somebody or, or something goes completely unexpected and you're kind of the point person as the leader who's supposed to be there as the point person for all these things, if you're panicking and going, uh, that helps no one. <laughs> so you have to learn to be able to kind of let the brunt of the wave hit you and then kind of piece together what you need, make sure you're gathering everything and then respond in a calm manner. So being able to, to uh, catch yourself having that visceral reaction, even if it's someone that's being rude to you or being a little, uh, a little, uh, you know, not, I wanna say off, but something that you're not comfortable with or that you don't experience a lot. Um, for me, my first move is always to just wait and listen because I don't know who this person is all the way. So how they're communicating to me might be somewhat that's natural for them in their culture and their community. And so me responding back as though I'm offended doesn't help anyone. So just being able to sit there and be like, okay, I'm assuming that most people aren't out to just make everyone stay harder. So maybe they had a rough day or something like that. So creating some type of excuse for the person and then taking a breath and then kind of trying to guide them on a path calmly. I've gotten many thanks for being able to do that because there have been circumstances um, not not necessarily just Juilliard because I volunteered for like film festivals and all these other um, things, but being able to be that kind of calming presence in an ocean of a lot of craziness goes a long, long, long way to help a lot of people. Yeah, I, I think theoretically I should be the most comfortable with social media. I'm not sure if that's true or not, um, but I think for, for my generation, even at the like going through school just a couple of years later for music education, it was not really touched on what to do about social media, um, whether it be for yourself as an artist or in general. The only thing we had was at some point uh, towards the end before we did our student teaching, we got sat down and said, okay, here's sort of the social media talk. So you've got to like Clean make sure your security setting. Yeah, exactly. Clean it up security settings, make sure no one can find you, uh, change your name, um, do everything in your power to have it basically be a non-factor for you as a professional. Because it is such a weird time, especially as an undergrad, when you do have to be that person at the front of the room. You're, you're learning how to be, you know the information by then, you know how to deliver it, that you've spent your entire time talk, you know, learning that and, getting, and mastering that. But it's about how do you present yourself? How as a intellectual leader and being a teacher in front of somebody teaching something that's so subjective anyway, you know, you can teach notes, but really you, you need to exude um, the feeling of music and arts and everything. Um, doing that and, you know, social media weren't really mixed together. It was mostly like, just put your best foot forward. Um, but now I'm seeing a change and I'm not saying I know how to do this at all, but I think the change is that we're more okay, and part of it is because of this year, but we're more okay with this part of our life being a benefit to maybe our professional lives, especially in you know, arts when we are sharing ourselves or someone is sharing themselves. And I, 
a benefit of that is actually feeling like you're approachable and feeling as though this is something that I just felt inspired to do this. And yes, big artists have social media managers who, you know, they spend their time making sure that it's all clean and all good, you know, same, same deal as the, the social media talk I had, but the, the difference I'm seeing is that it, it can be a, a huge asset when you're a young artist who is also trying to, you know, you don't just have to have a resume and a sort of stiff recital recording. That's not how, maybe that's not the whole picture anymore. And because of social media, you're able to round everything out and, and feel that you yourself are adding to your art, even if you're not playing, because you as a person, just as what we were saying, being a leader or being an organizer or just being someone to work with, it's so, so important to be the person who's the most approachable, the least, not the least problematic, because that's, you know, that's, we want to strive for better than that. But the, really the person who's able to say, I'm someone you can come up to and just have a conversation with. I'm also going to know what you need. If you're asking, you know, you want to have the answers, but if it's going to get crazy, it'll be fine. Just what Carlin said, like you, you want to be the person who is just comfortable for someone who may be from the outside and social media, everyone's kind of on the outside. So to be comfortable in such a quick space, whether that be an entire organization like Chamber Music Society at Lincoln Center, who's super active on Instagram because that, I follow them on Instagram and saw a post like two hours ago, that was really cool. Um, it's just like little clips, little little moments and they're more important than ever now, but they can serve you as, as a, a sort of personality resume if, if you do it a certain way. and, and it's been nice to see that shift because that was never something, maybe I would have done it if I was in school now, you know, maybe I would post, I'd be more comfortable posting or performing, um, but who knows? But I think it's a, it's a new medium to test. Um, and I, oh, and to the last thing, I, I touched on it a bit, but, and seconding what everyone else has said, like when we go back to normal, but even, even now the, everything, all of these organizations and any answers to questions you might be having or any places that you might get questions, you know, just places to look, go online, look at organizations, see how they're structured, see what the staff is like, see what is offered there, like type in carnegiehall.org and see actually what Carnegie Hall is running, you know. And it's not just an open space where people play. It's, it's thousands of people behind the scenes and seeing what, you know, really exploring what it's like to, to expand your thinking. I, I think that we get narrower and narrower as we get closer to, to acquiring your degree. And then if you go to graduate school, it's that much finer uh, of a sort of recipe. <laughs> so, so to take those opportunities to really almost compartmentalized. Here's my degree, but here's here's everything that's going on around me. And and this is what other people are bringing to the table that could be just passing by that I can really take advantage of and explore. Um, it, it, I think it's it's one of the biggest things I wish, I, I tell anyone, you'd wish you'd done it more. <laughs> I'm thankful that I did it in some fashion and got to where I'm able to do it in a new place now, but to, to do it as a student, or to go on to whatever you're doing and to just constantly evolve. Your learning's not gonna turn off when you get a degree. You're not gonna be like, I'm done. It's it's the beginning, right? You, you've gotten to a place where you can move to the next room and the next room's gonna have so many more things. So, and as they said before, the other two people said, I, I am so open to any emails. I'm open to doing a Zoom chat with people because um, Zoom's not going to go away, which is great. <laughs> I think that I'm hoping that that continues for for students or for anyone who wants to to discuss life or just arts and what it'll be. But I'm I'm very open to to any conversations, as Carlvin and Kelly said. So just stay stay with it. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be okay. We're gonna be in concerts again, and yeah. and it's gonna be wonderful. <laughs> You, this is this is so fantastic. I feel like we should um, we should do part two, like a live Zoom chat with our students. Seriously, because we could go on for another hour. 
Um, and, and you all are just given such great advice. I, I can't thank you enough. And um, I, I'm gonna say this to the camera um, for the students who are watching this. If you do wanna get in touch with any of these panelists, uh, just shoot me an email. And I think they, they're all saying it's okay for me to um, send their contact information to you. Um, so y'all, this was great. I learned a lot um, and, and I just, your advice is also sort of, um, also bigger life advice, which is really great about careers in general. So um, really appreciate your time uh, today. And um, we'll, uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thanks. Uh, thanks, y'all. Bye. Thanks for having us.